Hello, everybody. Thank you for coming out tonight to the Natural Resources Commission's Bright Ideas Workshop on Smart Outdoor Lighting. My name is Raina McManus, and I'm the chair of the Natural Resources Commission, or the NRC, which oversees the use, preservation, and protection of our town's park and conservation areas. It's the care of these lands that have us concerned about any type of pollution that can, that can affect their, and consequently our, health. You may be aware that the NRC sponsored the townwide ban on single-use plastic checkout bags after witnessing the harmful effects of plastic pollution on our wildlife and environment. Another type of pollution is light pollution, caused when lights are improperly shielded, too bright, or the wrong color, which we'll learn more about this evening. Years ago, when people thought about light pollution, it was mostly in relation to the loss of the night sky. However, the more we learn, the more we realize that light that is pointing downward is just as impactful to our health, our safety, and our natural environment. It's for these reasons the NRC has plans to develop a lighting policy for our conservation and parklands. We're here tonight because everyone uses outdoor lights, businesses, municipalities, and homeowners and homeowners have front and backyards, and while we really don't consider it, these are actually valuable habitat for trees and vegetation, large and small wildlife, and insects, many of which, like moths, are important nighttime pollinators. Many yards also abut our conservation lands or are located in wetland resource areas, which are under the jurisdiction of our Wetlands Protection Committee and are especially sensitive to artificial light at night. It turns out that wildlife, as well as a beam of light, do not recognize property lines. As more and more research points to the disruptive effects of artificial light at night, the NRC wanted to bring you tonight's program to explain the importance of good outdoor lighting, how to recognize it, and how to use it correctly. This long-held desire to mitigate light pollution came to the fore last year when the MLP decided to replace 3,000 neighborhood streetlights with LED fixtures. As LEDs can last as long as 20 years, the NRC saw a once-in-a-generation opportunity to make sure that the light emitted by the new LEDs, particularly on and around NRC land, would be as environmentally friendly as possible while, of course, maintaining safety standards. Our speaker tonight, Bob Parks, has been an invaluable resource to us on this matter, and we are also grateful to the Municipal Light Board for working with us on this part of the project. So to begin our evening, I'd like to introduce MLP Board Chair Paul Criswell, who has kindly agreed to start us off with a brief summary of the plans for the, for the LED streetlight conversion and the pilot program that will give us all a chance to provide input on the fixtures that will line our streets for many years to come. Please join me in welcoming Paul. Thank you, Raina, very much. Thank you for that uh, kind introduction. And I'm uh, very uh, pleased and proud that you credit us with at least being part of uh, beginning this conversation on, uh, on healthy lighting within, uh, within the town of Wellesley. So uh, thank you for, for that. We'll, uh, we'll, we'll take as much credit as we can get. Um, so uh, the municipal light plant is responsible for the care and maintenance of the street lights within the town of, of Wellesley. <laughs> Uh, the jurisdiction, the ultimate jurisdiction is shared with us and the Board of Selectmen uh, because they're very much a, a public safety issue. And then many of the, uh, the lights around are also either on NRC land or are, are contiguous with NRC land. So there's a lot of different boards within, uh, within the town who have responsibility here. Uh, and um, so we're happy to, uh, to be able to cooperate uh, with everybody in, in getting this right. Um, let me tell you, in, in uh, just in, in a, uh, a brief nutshell, the project that we are doing right now is to retrofit 3,100 high-pressure sodium streetlights within the town of Wellesley, and we're going to replace them with LED uh, streetlights. This will provide a reduction of about 930,000 kilowatt hours per year, uh, or kilowatts per year, it will result in a taxpayer savings of about $125,000 a year. 
And um, in terms of energy savings, just to, uh, to measure it, it would roughly be the equivalent of taking about 134 cars off of the streets here in, in Wellesley. This program came about, it's something that we've had our eyes on for, for quite some time, but recently we became aware of, we applied for, and we were awarded a grant by the Department of Energy Resources within the, um, within the uh, Commonwealth and they are providing us with $281,000 towards this LED retrofit. The overall project we think will cost around $900,000, so a uh, almost $300,000 grant is very helpful to us in, in, uh, in keeping the, uh, the cost down. The Board of Selectmen from their budget are contributing about $100,000 and the Municipal Light Board is contributing uh, about a half a million dollars towards the, uh, towards the LED retrofit. Uh, timeline. Um, we issued a request for proposal to the various lighting manufacturers in, in, in the industry back on September 19th. We have also installed um, pi a pilot set of lights on Pine Street and Croton Street for community members to take a look at and, and, uh, and see what, uh, whether you like them or not. And I'll, I'll say a little bit more about that a, a little later on. Uh, when we installed those, we hand delivered a certain number of surveys to people who, are, who live on those streets. And we, uh, tomorrow, will be mailing out to uh, everyone in town a, uh, a survey with regard to how you like the new LED lights and, and what you like about them, what you don't like a, a, about them. Uh, we'd like to get the surveys back by October 13th and then we will finally uh, award the LED fixture um, pur purchase contract uh, towards the end of October. What we've asked for in, in, the, in, the, um, in the request for proposal is for people to come back to us with a menu of the various different types of bulbs that we can that we can purchase from them and what the costs would be for, for those bulbs. Um, we'll begin on uh, December 14th to install <coughs> these uh, around town and our plan is to complete this by May 31st. In order to uh, uh, collect on the uh, DOER grant, we have to complete this by, uh, by June 30th. And we're very comfortable right now that we're going to, to be able to, uh, to, to do this. So we're segregating this into two aspects. Number one, uh, we are, as we always have, are reserving our brightest lights for the main traveled roads, Route 9, Route 135, Route 16, various uh, places like that. That's approximately 900 um, street lights. And um, then we are also going to be replacing bulbs in residential areas. And here's where the, uh, where, the sur where the pilot comes in and where the survey comes in. I'm sure you all know that LED bulbs pre create both a whiter and a, uh, a brighter light than, than incandescent bulbs do, what, we're, what we are replacing. And so we're trying to address that in a way that number one, people will be comfortable with, and number two, that, that is, is environmentally and, and from a health uh, standpoint, uh, optimal for the town of Wellesley. So um, we have installed four light fixtures on Croton Street and four on Pine Street. And um, so one of the things that you can do to, uh, to, to uh, buffer, if you will, the, the, the whiteness of LED bulbs is to lower the Kelvin rating. And uh, a lot of towns have put in what are rated as four thousand Kelvin lights. The town of Acton did that, for example, ju just recently. And that's, you know, those are as white as, as you can get. What, uh, what we have managed to find and what we are piloting here are bulbs that are 3,000 Kelvin and bulbs that are 2,700 Kelvin. And those, at least so far, are the lowest Kelvin ratings that we've been able to find that are, are you know, standard manufactured products so that, that we are, uh, are able to, uh, to, to install in such large quantities. So 
I can't tell you which bulbs are, are which on uh, pine and croton. You're going to have to figure that out for yourself, and I can't tell you because I don't know. And uh, I can tell you there's two people uh, in the back of the room who, who know, and uh, we've tried everything we can do to give them to, get them to spill the beans, and, and they won't do that. But if you go down Route 16, take a left on Croton. The first uh, fixture on the right is one of the old uh, sodium, uh, high-pressure sodium. Then the next four are LED bulbs. You'll get to the end of Croton. You turn right. There are two more old high-pressure sodium bulbs. And then Pine Street makes a 90-degree turn. And the next four are the next set of LED bulbs. So uh, I would ask every one of you to please go take a drive, do it, tell us, uh, tell us what you like uh, in terms of Kelvin rating of, of, the, um, of the, um, the, the bulbs. Um, the uh, survey will be mailed to all residents and we're gonna ask people to rank their importance, what they believe is importance, financial savings to the town, uh, pedestrian visibility, driver visibility, uh, you know, safety type issues, and then environmental and, and carbon reduction benefits. Um, and then let me talk to you for a second about brightness. And one of the things about uh, LED lights is that a lot of people think that uh, a comparable bulb, I shouldn't say a lot of people think, and, and, and Bob, please correct me gently if I'm wrong in any of this uh, as, I'm, as I'm saying it, but they can be brighter than, than equivalent high pressure sodium or incandescent bulbs. One of the things that we are doing as part of this LED retrofit is that we are specifying that the bulbs that we purchase will be compatible with controllers which at a later time can be installed on each of these lights so that basically you can dial them down if you think the brightness is not what, uh, not what you would like. And that's what I'll call stage two of this, and that's something that we need to do after a broad town-wide conversation involving the NRC, involving the municipal light plant, and involving the uh, selectmen, because there are obviously safety, environmental, and uh, you know, reliability uh, expense criteria that go into all of that selection. But what we are trying to do in this phase one is to set the table so that the town can have that conversation and can, uh, can take control, at least of this aspect of their outdoor lighting as, uh, as we move forward. So when, uh, when we finally do get to the point that we are uh, purchasing, that we award the contract and we're actually purchasing light bulbs, uh, we have to, in order to get the DOER grant, we have to do what they roughly call replace like for like. So we will have to replace with comparable uh, illumination. We have uh, you know, our uh, criteria that they have to be utility grade. Uh, we have as a criteria that they have to be capable of being, of being dimmed, if, if you will, of, of, being, of having uh, controllers on them. Uh, they have to meet all of the other DOER requirements. They have to, uh, and then we'll also judge based on price uh, and on the feedback that we receive from all of you folks uh, as we go through the, uh, the pilot uh, project. Uh, and then we also obviously have to have them delivered uh, in time. So I have to say that one of, the, one of the best things about being chair of the MLP this year and getting to do this presentation is that I get to stand up here and I get to tell you all the wonderful things that are happening and I didn't do much, if any, of the work, but I'll take, I'll take all, of, all of the credit. Uh, the people that, uh, that really did the, uh, the work here, and first of all is the uh, municipal light plant staff uh, who have done a fabulous job of, uh, of working on this so far. And then we have also had an ad hoc lighting committee that has just been invaluable in, in providing feedback, input, and, and guidance as we've gone along. And that's been Raina McManus, uh, Jessica Stanton, I don't think, ah, Jessica is back there. Uh, Regina Larock, also from the, from the NRC. Katie Gibson from, uh, from the Light Board. Uh, and then this person called WMLP staff who are also sitting there in, in, in the back. 
So I want to thank all of you for everything you've done here. You're the, the people that have really had the, um, the laboring oar in, in, in all of this. So uh, as I say, we have to have a conversation in this town uh, with regard to municipal lighting and with regard to all other aspects of, of our lighting in town. And graciously, the NRC has brought in an expert to, uh, to help us with that conversation and to uh, kick that off with, uh, with uh, his expertise. So let me tell you about Bob Parks. Bob is an ecological lighting design consultant. He's a member of the Illuminating Engineering Society and he is lighting certified. He is the founder of the Virginia Outdoor Lighting Task Force or VOLT. I don't know how that will translate to, to, to Massachusetts, to, to, to Bolt, uh, but we'll, we'll come up with something if, if we can. Uh, Volt is an all-volunteer, nonprofit grassroots advocacy group working for safe and efficient outdoor lighting since year 2000. Bob has served as the executive director of the International Dark Sky Association and is the founder of the nonprofit Smart Outdoor Lighting Alliance, or SOLA. Uh, you can find more information about Bob on your uh, event program, and I'd ask you to please uh, join me in welcoming Bob Parks. Please don't look behind the curtain. We're now getting set up. Okay, thanks for coming tonight. Uh, I'd like to give you a crash course in LED lighting and best practices for public lighting. Uh, you can stop me along the way if you have an important question or after we'll, we'll have plenty of time and you can uh, save the questions up. And uh, away we go. <clears throat> so. What's important when we look at public lighting is what are the goals, what have we been doing for the last hundred years with public lighting, and uh, what can we do as we move forward for this major transition to LED lighting. Uh, primarily, what we are looking for with this transition is to reduce energy costs, to reduce the cost of public lighting, as well as maintenance costs, and LEDs do this exceptionally well. Uh, and we can go into some more details later, but we always do public lighting primarily to improve driver and pedestrian safety. Uh, it is a key goal in any transformation of outdoor lighting and something uh, we'll address in this presentation. Uh, and we want to reduce crime and redu enhance the feeling of safety. And there, there's a discussion on that. They're not exactly the same thing, but good public lighting will assist both. And we want to deter litiga litigation. So we want to put in quality lighting that meets all the recommended uh, standards so that uh, we won't have any problems down the road. And uh, good public lighting promotes commercial activity which means you know, people will bring businesses to the city and it enhances social interaction. So if you have a, a pleasant public lighting environment, you're going to have more people that want to come into the city, spend time there at night and uh, enjoy it. It also helps communities and residents with their mobility within the, the city. Uh, and we have the opportunity as we're moving forward now to do great things with reducing the negative impacts of public lighting. Uh, the tools that we had in the toolbox before uh, didn't allow us to do that in many ways. So what we're doing now is we're moving into a new generation of lighting that has so much more capability and we'll talk about how we can do better lighting. But we will be able to reduce the ecological impact which is important. Uh, we can also reduce the physical impact of lighting. So reducing glare, light trespass, and up light, uh, which is sky glow. So all of these things, as we transition, you should see a, a, a serious improvement in. 
So this will be a crash course in lighting technology, and I'm going to go through really fast. I just want to make sure that you have some awareness of why it's better. Uh, and it starts with the fact that we have, for the last 50 plus years, used a high pressure sodium lighting, which was very energy efficient, the most energy efficient source at the time. Uh, but as you know, it's a yellow light. And that yellow light, the major difference between LED is the visibility that you can get with white light. The eye sees best under white light. So as we transition, we're going to see vast improvements in visibility. And that should increase safety and reduce uh, accidents. Uh, but we're going to talk a little bit about why that is. Uh, there, there is a downside, and as Paul addressed, uh, Wellesley is looking at the right color temperature. Uh, the warmer color temperature will reduce some of the negative impacts from uh, increased blue content, blue-ish white light, uh, actually increases the impact of glare and makes it feel like a different community, okay? As you move from a very warm yellow light to a very cool white light, communities that have made that transition to high CCT find that it fundamentally changes the ambiance of the neighborhood. So by keeping the color temperature warmer, we think, and actually uh, Raina and I were out in, in uh, surveying the, the pilot area, and we can report it it's, feels much more like a community uh, with the warmer light levels. So uh, in addition, uh, the pilot and the pers perspective fixtures that are going to be used in your pilot or your transition are all going to be full, full, fully shielded. So that means you're going to have no uplight from those fixtures, which is going to improve the sky glow. And you're also, and I can report from what I've seen, are using great optics that are going to direct the light onto the road, not into your windows, and that will in, improve the quality of life. With, LA, with, with high pressure sodium, we didn't have the fine control. Uh, to really light a street, we often had to overlight the street. We had to go beyond the border of the street. In a uh, community that has very narrow streets, houses close together, that often meant there was a lot of light trespass. Light trespass is when you're putting light where you should not, and that means that if you have a bedroom window and you have a lot of light coming in it, it's not doing anybody good. And the, the good news is with LED, the control is so much better that you can now uniformly put that light where you want it. And you get a higher level of light and you get better uniformity. And that will be something you'll notice right away. Uh, and the warmer CCT, one of the things that we stress in our uh, program is increasing visual comfort, OK? The higher the visual comfort of the fixture, it means it's reduced glare. And when you look at it, it doesn't give you flash bulb-like burn. But the warmer color temperature also gives a warmer feeling. The ambiance of the, the light is going to be warmer. It's still going to be much whiter. You're going to see a dramatic change from what you had to what you'll get. And, and that's part of what you want to give the, uh, the MLP feedback on. So this is uh, one of your neighbors. This is a, a shot of the Cambridge, Massachusetts uh, uh, retrofit. They started their retrofit almost eight years ago and completed it about three years ago. It was the first complete citywide retrofit using LED and controls. So the entire installation from the beginning was engineered to maximize energy efficiency, and they did so by uh, putting in controls that allow them to reduce lighting level late at night. So at 10 o'clock, all of the fixtures within the city are reduced by 50% from their start level. Uh, overall, that gave them the ability to reduce overall energy 73%, which is pretty much the record in the country today. Uh, they did so with 4,000K, which is really the only fault that we can find with this, but 
This was engineered five years ago, and that was pretty much the de facto color temperature. Uh, any less than that, you would have had a hard time getting many manufacturers to even provide that. So they also, you fortunately are blessed by the fact that you don't have the dreaded acorn lights, which are uh, pretty much the standard fare for Cambridge. Uh, we invented them in Washington, D.C., and I'm, I'm sorry to say uh, they've spread to other cities. Uh, this, this Washington Globe, which is now generically called an acorn light, was invented by a person on the Fine Arts Commission in Washington, D.C. in 1912. And in 1912, that plastic fixture was leaded glass, and it had about the same amount of light that you would have in your uh, lamp on your desk, a uh, very small amount of light generated. So it didn't generate that much glare. It was also very warm. Uh, the gentleman that invented that fixture uh, was praised. He got on a boat. It was called the Titanic. He died, uh, and it's now his legacy. So we will be cursed with the Washington Globe in Washington, D.C. for the rest of our days. Uh, but I digress. Uh, <laughs> so the incre increased visibility of LED is allowing us to use lower lighting levels. Now, that means that in the past, many cities, including Cambridge, used a higher than IES minimum recommended lighting level. And because of the high pressure sodium and the, the, the less than optimum visibility that you got that, people felt you needed more light, sorry. Uh, what we now know is with LED white light, no matter what color temperature you have, the IES minimum is actually the maximum that you want to use. And I can also report that the MLP has used what I, I have measured as the IS minimum. And that is a great step forward because the shock of going from an overlit high pressure sodium to an overlit LED is breathtaking. Uh, if you don't believe me, talk to the folks in the Bronx. Uh, they just got part of a 250,000 light retrofit in New York using 4,000 K and 250,000 or 250 percent of the IS minimum, two and a half times the light that they actually should be using. And everybody in the Bronx let the news media know exactly how happy they were. Uh, and what that means is, that, you know, as we transition with this new uh, lighting, we can start focusing more on pedestrians and cars. Uh, the visibility factor means that we will now be able to get uniformity and we should be looking at how we do a better job with intersections, pedestrian crossings, and crosswalks because that's where the safety is the most critical for pedestrians. We'll talk a little more about how we do that later. And. Uh, on one of the factors that many cities do not know and why I do a lot of travel to tell them is that the IS standards today allow for cities to reduce their lighting level. And they do it based on the quantity of vehicle to pedestrian traffic at a specific time of night. We know at rush hour that level is, is going to be higher and it could be significantly higher for a couple hours from you know, 6 to 8 o'clock maybe. Uh, what we also know in almost every city in the country, by the time it's 10 o'clock or later, the lighting or the traffic level has reduced to such a level that it will qualify for a lighting level reduction based on the ISRPA. So you have to give, uh, you have to approximate your traffic volumes at the time of night. In Cambridge, they did the traffic counts and they found that by 10 o'clock at night, in 90% of the city, they could reduce their lighting levels by 50%. Uh, they keep their main thoroughfares at full level until midnight. And they also have the ability with controls to make changes. So if there's going to be a game, uh, a lot of activity around Harvard or whatever, they will actually increase the lighting level and keep it until that traffic has died down. You have all that flexibility. But what I want to make clear is these levels are part of the standard. So when you want to adopt controls, 
you have the ability to save a lot more energy than just converting to LED. And this is uh, based on you know good new research is that we now know that the bright or the the whiteness of the new LED will actually appear 50% brighter to the human eye than what the same level in HPS is. So high pressure sodium, which is what you're currently using, if you were to put the exact same levels of light, you will feel like the lighting is 50% brighter, although the quantity of light with a light meter is exactly the same. So this is a crash course in how we see. You guys are going to be experts on vision and lighting by the time you leave. You're welcome. Uh, one thing that's a, it, it's hard to understand, but our standards are all focused on brightness and uniformity. And that's the metric we've chosen for the last 50 plus years. So if you engineer a road, you engineer a road, how bright, how much light are you going to have? and how uniform is that light going to be across the surface of the road. So in the old days with high pressure sodium, what you will see is a lot of dark and light. You cannot get uniformity out of a high pressure sodium fixture. It's just not in its nature. It's not the way it was designed. So underneath of a high pressure sodium fixture, you'll have a bright pool of light. And 15 feet away, it'll drop off significantly. By 30 or 40 feet away, you're in the dark. Okay, but brightness by itself doesn't aid visibility. It's part of it. What we actually see is contrast. We see the difference between dark and light. A lighted person with a shadow behind them is much more visible than a person that has the same amount of light on them as it is behind them because it doesn't stand out. The contrast is not as high. So what we're now finding is that with new technology, we have to start thinking about new ways to improve visibility. And one of those things, I, I sit on the IS uh, Outdoor Environmental Lighting Committee. We're looking into this. The Art Roadway Lighting Committee is looking into this. And we hope that in the future, the standards will actually catch up with the technology. But it's been a fast moving train. And it's hard to do that with uh, a lot of volunteer committees. So. Beyond that, uh, so I just want to reiterate that increasing the brightness of your lights will not necessarily increase the visibility. And that's counterintuitive, but we can show a couple examples in the future. Uh, what does is using contrast to its best effect. So one thing we now know why LED light is so much better is that we can see color. In the old days with high pressure sodium, we had a very limited uh, color spectrum because it was primarily a yellow light, which meant at a distance, an object would appear only by its luminance or its brightness against the background. Really, you did not detect color. So 100 feet away, you wouldn't be able to tell the difference between a yellow and a blue uh, object in the road. Well. That's all changed. With broad spectrum white light, we now have the ability to detect at a greater distance objects, objects in the road because now we can see color well. And that, that goes for any white light. It doesn't matter the color temperature. Uh, as long as it has a broad spectrum white light, you are now going to see better. So this is kind of a silly example of you would not see under high pressure sodium these two uh, objects. Uh, much different. But now you can see with broad spectrum white light, that yellow uh, coat is going to stand out from a distance. And this is all good for improving safety and visibility. And color or, or white light is the key to that. Do you have a question? I, I skipped over. You kind of lost me in this part between contrast. Uh, oh, sorry. Could you repeat the part about it's important to see about the to see with contrast, but then you're talking about color and 
Yeah, and it, the next it got confusing will for me. show you some more examples, but this is what we're calling chrominance contrast, and that's color contrast. So your eye is detecting an object because of the difference of the color of the object and its background, and that's giving you that same improved visibility as we would see in the next slide. So for instance, the next example of contrast, that is negative contrast. There is no light on that pedestrian from your vantage point at all. What you're actually seeing is the lack of light on that pedestrian, but you see that pedestrian without any light from your vantage point. All the light's coming from the other direction. That's negative luminance contrast. That's seeing contrast, but seeing it with backlight. And this is an example of positive luminance contract. A contrast, a well-lit pedestrian with high levels of vertical illumination, you pick that person out because behind it the lighting level is much reduced. So the light level is high on the subject, low on the background. So this is giving you another form of contrast. And so those three forms improve your visibility dramatically. So white light gives this High pressure sodium only gave you contrast and luminance, and it was not, you know, as good because it was, it didn't give you sharp definition on objects. It was a warmer light. This is, is a, a vast improvement. So, one of the things uh, a municipal uh, government has to look at when you're doing the conversion is what, what are all the factors, the choices that you have to make? And so the first one is, what's your lighting level? And I, and I congratulate you know, Wellesley for picking the right light, lighting level. Picking the IS minimum is the proper illumination level at this point. We will find in the, past, in the future, as we re review and revise standards, I am certain that we are going to come up with a uh, lower illumination level requirement for broad spectrum LED light. Might be two years, might be five years, but it will be coming. And that's another good reason to be considering controls. Uh, but I, I just stress, and I'll hammer this, anything higher than the IS minimum at this point is unwarranted, and it also will end up being uh, energy waste. And since you're trying to reduce that, uh, you, you want to stay where you are. And so uh, the, the big question is, okay, if we keep the lighting levels at IS minimums, isn't that reducing you know, our light level and won't that increase crime? And I, I can say definitively based on peer-reviewed research that no, uh, increasing lighting levels doesn't have an impact on crime, okay? It's, it's an it's a urban myth that's been perpetrated over about 50 years. So having the right amount of light so that you have good visibility will reduce accidents and will reduce pedestrian fatalities and all the things that you care about. So keeping the right level of light is, is really important. And overlighting high, uh, high crime areas because you're concerned about a crime issue in a certain neighborhood. I know you don't have any of that in Wellesley, but other cities do. And when they do it, they tend to overlight those areas like a prison. So they, they jack up the light levels, they use really high intensity blue, bluish white light, and they make it abundantly clear to everybody driving through, do not slow down, accelerate because this is a bad area, you don't want to stop at a traffic light, okay? What happens, though, is that may have happened in the 60s, and the, the lighting people improved, increased the lighting levels to try to eradicate crime. So it probably didn't have any impact on it, but 40 years later, that neighborhood still is lit at those high light levels with you know, too much uh, you know, bluish white light. And what it does is stigmatize that neighborhood forever. So until it's rethought, redesigned, re-engineered, everybody in that neighborhood is living with that stigma, even though the crime may be long gone. So the other big choice, and once again, I congratulate Wellesley for picking the right color choice, because this has been a battleground for the last five years. Uh, cities 
uh, across the country have made choices, and some of those choices have come back to haunt them. Uh, I can tell you Davis, California, uh, a similar sized town to Wellesley, had 2,900 uh, mm -hmm. light fixtures that they were in the process of replacing. They chose uh, 4,800K as the CCT, the color temperature, and they chose about 200% of IS minimum, which was how they were lighting with high pressure sodium. So it was the same like for like exchange. So they thought everything was going quite well until the neighborhoods uh, marched on City Hall with torches and pitchforks. <laughs> and it was not pretty. Uh, they literally forced a, a public meeting. And in that public meeting, over 100 people signed up to talk about it, and not one of them was saying anything positive about it. You don't want to be there. Uh, and the, the, the board, the city council, had to really stop and rethink how they were doing things. Because in this case, they didn't have a municipal lighting uh, uh, group. What they had was a, they, they vended it out to an outside group, an energy management group that was coming in to give, a, give them the light and they didn't have to pay for it because they were going to be paid back in energy savings. So what the group did was maximize energy efficiency to the nth degree, thus the high color temperature and you would think they would also be you know, the ones pushing the light level down because that would reduce energy and they would have saved more money. But the end result, jump to the chase, was they deliberated for almost two months. They did a lot of uh, informal surveys. They had pilot tests and they gave their citizens choices from 2,700K to 4,000K at different lighting levels and the citizens uniformly and almost unanimously picked the lowest color temperature, 2700, that was given to them, and they voted to reduce the lighting level by 60%, which actually made it slightly less than the IS minimum. Uh, but this is a, a, you know, it's a very similar demographic. It's a, it's a highly educated, uh, I'd say wealthy community, and uh, they don't, they didn't want to look like a shopping mall. What they wanted to look like was a community. And they made the steps and they told their elected folks what they wanted. At the end of the day, they did a stop and they did a, a change order that cost the city $300,000. They pulled down most of the lights that had already been installed, over half had been installed, and replaced them with the new fixtures. So they're saving more energy and that's great. Uh, they reduced that, but the change order means that they almost doubled the payback period because they're now going to be paying for that mistake. So I tell every city, you want to make these decisions up front. You want to do the pilot testing. You want to get the community feedback early and often so you're not surprised. And color is a, a hot button issue. And what we preach to everybody we talk to is it's a community standard. It doesn't, it's not the same from one state to the next, one community to the next. You have to assess it, and once you've assessed it, enshrine it in your, your documents as your community standard choice. So it may be different. You may actually want a, a higher color temperature downtown, but in the neighborhoods you want a warmer color temperature. Do that assessment early. You will never go wrong asking the, the public what they want because trust me, they will tell you eventually. So, and we just reiterate, this, this warmer color temperature in neighborhoods, residential communities, improves or at least preserves the character and ambiance of a community. Changing it drastically to a high color temperature will make it look much more like a shopping mall and most people don't like that transition. But a high CCT, we touched on earlier, it, it enhances the bad things in a lighting installation. So if you had glare before and you now change from high pressure sodium glare to LED glare, it will be noticeable because it is visually, it's better. That means you see better, but you also notice that glare, much more than what you have noticed in high pressure sodium. It's also the same thing with light trespass. 
and I've got a great slide for you that's coming up, and you can see what it looks like in the Bronx or the Brooklyn after they changed, and they have so much light trespass that you can actually read a newspaper inside without the lights on. <laughs> and it also reduces the impact of uh, circadian and ecological disruption. Big important issue. So in the past, using high color temperature was, the excuse was always we're saving energy. Why not save all the energy we possibly can? To wit, I said to everybody saying that, how come you're not installing controls? You're worried about all the energy, but you're not worried about all that energy. You're just worried about getting the efficacy out of that fixture. It's a total system. Worry about all the pieces. This is an installation on a college campus near me in Fairfax. That's George Mason University. This is an installation that was done over five years ago and was done with warm white light, generally speaking, between 3,000 and 2,700. Those fixtures were hard to get five years ago. They did this installation. They did it with the right amount of light, and they did it with the right color temperature. All this slide makes it look a little uh, greener than it actually is. Uh, but you can see they're using all the right things. These are full cutoff bollards to mark pathways. When you come out, the whole circle is just lit with a bollard. It's not, no overhead lights at all. There are some overhead lights on the path back there, and you see sconces that are uh, decorative. This is what I promise you. This is Brooklyn. This is Brooklyn after the first wave of an LED retrofit that is now on the books as the least popular in history. Uh, this generated more news, uh, more nightly news than any retrofit in history. The movie camera, I mean, the, the, the television trucks were permanently camped in Brooklyn. Uh, and they were getting interviews inside the homes. They were walking. What you're seeing is an extremely poor quality fixture with a lot of glare. And that was the same quality fixture they had with high pressure sodium, so they do have consistency going for them. Uh, but when they change to white light, that is a glare bomb. And you can see on the side across from that light, it looks like a movie set. They have lit up the side of those uh, townhouses so bright that you can't sleep inside the bedrooms because even with blackout drapes, it's getting through. That's an abomination of nature. Uh, and it also makes it incredibly difficult to walk at night and feel comfortable. You're walking in an environment with nothing but glare. And that does not make a community feel like a community. And once again, this is 4,000K, which it could have been worse, but it's, it's bad enough. If you choose the wrong fixtures, uh, this is what you're going to end up with. So really what we are trying to promote above anything that you've heard in any other venue is we have an opportunity now to, to do lighting with visual comfort. What is visual comfort? Okay, It's got a couple components. First of all, that is not visual comfort. Okay, Having glare, having a bright point, of so point uh, source glare makes it impossible to walk down the street without, when you close your eyes, it's like a flash bulb went off, okay? It will, it will have that imprint on you, okay? High CC, high CCT aggravates that, but any high point source glare is gonna have the same factor. So keep in mind that we have the tools now to change that, and changing that can be done in a couple different ways. Okay, first of all, we've got to use the right fixtures. The bug rating is an IAS uh, standard that's backlight, uplight, glare. So you want to use the absolute lowest rating in uplight and glare, okay? Uplight keeps the, uh, you know, out of the sky glow. Uh, glare keeps it out of your eyes, both when you're driving and when you're walking down the street. That improves visual comfort. Uh, and the chasing of uniformity is a something that we've been doing for 50 plus years. Once again, the standards are all based around brightness and uniformity. So in order to get that uniformity, 
what we see over and over again is designs in which they're trying to push light out at such a high angle, 70 degrees or 80 degrees, that's your eyes. That's where you're going to be walking and you're going to have that in your eyes. The higher that light is coming out of a fixture, the less visual comfort you're going to end up having. So by keeping it lower, you're not going to have that adverse impact as much. Uh, that's one factor. But when you do that, not only does it increase glare, that is why you see light trespass on all those buildings, is that to get it up high this way, they also have it high on the other direction. Uh, it's just a bad engineering decision. So uh, another way of improving visual comfort is diffusion of that point source light. Okay, if you look at some eye, uh, light around town, you have some early generation LEDs that may have 60 or 80 LEDs with individual lenses in there. I don't recommend looking at them. Okay, when you look at them, you will have 50 or 60 in impressions of those lights because they're as bright, when you measure them with a luminance meter, they're as bright as the sun. So at night, you have these point source images of the sun on these fixtures, and there's no way that's not going to impact you in a visual way. You're going to feel the, the glare of that, even when you're not looking at it. Uh, glare is almost 100% psychological. It's got a visual component, but we now know that the impression of glare is something your brain decides on, not your eye. So we now have choices. This is the really good news. And I'm going to move on without putting a sales pitch in. Uh, the fixture on the left is a fixture I used in a, a recent project in a condo. What they have done is turned LED on its ear. In the old days, we had a bulb in a fixture and a reflector. And that bulb reflected half of its light into a reflector and the other half was direct and that gave you the maximum amount of light out of the fixture that you could get. This is an LED fixture. All the LEDs are in that center cone but they're all pointed up and they're all reflecting off of a highly polished reflector and when they come back down they're even treating it with a frosting on, on the glass. So that in a pedestrian space is awesome and I can tell you from the last demo and mock-up, the residents just were blown away. Now, that's going to sacrifice some efficacy. You're going to lose 10 to 15 percent in that fixture. But that fixture is going to be at IS minimum and it's going to be dimmed. So we're still going to save 65 percent energy over the existing high-pressure sodium. So we, it's a matter of choices. What do you want? And, and design your lighting using all the available options to get it. This, on the other hand, doesn't require you to sacrifice any efficacy, and this is one of my favorites now. This is using something called a wave guide. Instead of individual lenses on individual LEDs, the LEDs are not actually visible because they're all lighting an edge light on a lens, which are look like fins coming off. There's two or three of them on each side. And what that's doing is allowing you to direct all the light just like you use a fiber optic. The light is going through the waveguide and then going out. You can look at this and you can look at it later outside. We have it installed and it won't blind you. And it's breathtaking because, well, first of all, they, they were the first fixture shipped with 3,000K that had the same efficacy as 4,000K, no loss at all. And we can order 2,700 with 3% less efficacy. Wow, that's, that's a breakthrough. So this fixture has just started shipping and it's awesome. So we're gonna wrap up talking about, you know, the last real big part of you know, outdoor lighting is this engagement with the public. It's an alien sort of environment and I, I, I sympathize with uh, uh, street lighting staff everywhere because this isn't how we've done it for the last 50 years. Uh, the engineering staff in a, in a DOT are the experts. They've always been the experts and for that reason they've always been 
told to just do it. Do it and, and make it great. Okay, and the choice is, the, the good news is, public lighting has moved at glacial paces for the last 50 years. A big energy efficient upgrade every 20 years, whether you're ready or not. Uh, we have had more change in the market in the last five years than happened in the last 50 years before that. And that makes it really tough to keep up. So all these things we're talking about, all the research that's just being done, it's really hard to keep up. I do it for a living, but a lot of folks in a staff environment don't have that training. They don't have that time to get that training. And what we need to do is kind of start changing our way we do business. And one of the ways we do it is reach out for uh, assistance, reach out for expert advice when you need it, and on a short-lived consulting basis. Take somebody else's, you know, pick their brain, get all the stuff you need, get what you need, and then move on. Uh, it's available and it helps in the long run. But no matter what, pilot test every option. Don't, don't, don't worry about giving people too many things to look at. If you're considering three different color temperatures, show three different color temperatures. If you're thinking about using lower light levels, show the lighting, lighting level at several different levels. Show them what it's going to look like when you dim it at 10 o'clock so they know not to be afraid. They'll know after they see it that that dimmed level is going to appear exactly the same as what they're replacing high pressure sodium at. 50% of IS men during rush hour is now going to be exactly the same brightness as they've experienced in the past. So solicit public preferences with surveys, walking tours, uh, use professionals when necessary to come up with survey questions that are probing and neutral so that you're not signaling what you want. You're basically giving them the option to tell you what they want. And then engage a broad demographic sampling. This is another alien uh, part of this is that you can't just wait for people to call in. You will get what we call the squeaky wheels. You'll get the people that always give you their feedback when they don't like something. That's 10% of the folks out there. The other 90% may love what you're doing, okay? It's in your best interest to get a broad sampling of everybody. You can't do that by waiting for them to send in a survey. You have to be proactive and you have to do outreach. And that's a different uh, way of doing this and we can talk more about it, but it's uh, you can use social media, you can use web and print advertising, direct mail, uh, print advertising, whatever it takes to get to all the people. Tell them what you're doing and then when it comes down to it, solicit people and the best surveys that we've conducted, you give out a $20, uh, well back in the day it was Barnes & Noble or Best Buy or something gift card, but you make them work for it. You make them go through surveys, sit through a presentation, walk the, the lighting level, come back and tell everybody uh, what, what you're going to do. And hold frequent town hall meetings. Uh, like I said, tell them what you're going to do, tell them what you're doing, tell them what you've done. Okay? It's not a one-step process. And use the, the feedback to base your uh, design decisions. So. We're running out of time, but I'm going to let you know that the AMA report was a, uh, a sea change for the lighting industry. It came out last summer, and the effects of it are still reverberating through the, the industry. What it said is that everything we just talked about, let's start thinking about the quality of light and the color temperature of light, because those are the factors they, they drilled down on. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time but I'm just going to go through everything we've talked about was pretty much in the report. They focused on the impact of circadian disruption on human health issues. That was why they came out with their report. And the outcome of that is that if you have those issues with circadian disruption, you're going to have a decreased quantity and quality of sleep, and that has a lot of downstream health consequences. And it adversely impacts ecology. Didn't make the headlines in any of the newspapers, but it's in the report as well. And they recommended using 3,000K or less. 
uh, and you're doing that, so that's a great thing. Uh, and to revert, reduce the adverse impact from all the things we talked about, glare, light, trespass, sky glow, and that will help minimize circadian disruption and the ecological impact. So this is what my organization is promoting, what I talk about around the world, not, and it's uh, lighting quality over quantity. Let's just get away from the old model and let's use controls whenever possible. It gives you a future proofing because things will change, trust me. And if you have controls, you can change with them. Vary that intensity to match the volume of pedestrian and, and vehicle traffic. Reduce the glare and up light. And we have a listing of all of the fixtures that have been certified for visual comfort, which is different than any other list out there. So you can look at different places and find good quality fixtures. They don't measure visual quality, visual comfort, sorry. And then we talk about this. This is all things that we've already talked about. That's the website. You can get an awful lot of information off of it. Uh, and we're going to add a few issues, uh, a few pieces here for your backyard. Okay, for what you do in your yard as opposed to what municipal uh, lighting is going to be. But they're all kind of the same. Uh, use only fully shielded fixtures. That's just a no-brainer. The IDA has been promoting that for the last 30 years. Uh, that reduces up light, but it also gives you a better quality of light. It's putting the light where you need it, not in your eyes, not in the sky. And the next factor is use the lowest quantity of light that you can. Don't start with a 100 watt bulb. Start with a, you know, an LED that may be 5 watts. You'll be shocked. That's the equivalent of 60 watt. And that would give you probably most light, uh, the most light you need for your doorstep. Uh, if you have a parking area, you might have to go up a little bit. But start low, work up. Don't start high and work down. And direct that light where it's needed. Be a good neighbor. Uh, Putting light into the neighbor's yard, into the neighbor's bedrooms, is the best way to no longer be a good neighbor. And, and hopefully you won't find out by the knock on the door of your neighbor who you've known for 50 years and now is really unhappy that they have to put up drapes in their house. Uh, good security lighting isn't lighting their, their backyard. Okay. And use motion controls. Nothing startles a burglar more than a light being off and then being on as soon as they walk into the yard. Uh, that also saves huge amounts of energy, 70, 90 percent of your energy bill, because it's not on when you don't need it. Uh, turn it off. There's a thing, a high-tech thing called a switch. They've had them for a <laughs> while. You can turn it off when you don't need it. And you can now, fortunately, through the work of IDA over the last few years, uh, we have talked, we, I used to be with IDA, we've talked Lowe's and Home Depot and stocking good fixtures. So this is a, a smattering of what you can now find without special ordering. And so you can tell there's a common theme. They're all shielded. And uh, some are LEDs and some are, you know, traditional fixtures, but uh, they all will do a good job for you. And that is it. Wow. Thank you. Wow. Thank you. Probably shouldn't have done that. Thank you, so Bob. You're seeing my desktop. That was incredible. Thank you so much. Um, we have about 10 minutes for some questions for either Paul about the, oh, I see some hands up already or Bob. So um, who do we have back there? Brandon, we'll bring you a microphone so that this gets on TV. Um, this question is for Bob. Whoa, I have a loud voice, sorry. Um, I'm curious, you're talking about street lights, but the other thing that I think is very impactful on people, particularly in tightly abutted neighborhoods around schools, is the sports lighting on fields. And I have been to the Dark Skies resource looking there, and there are no standards. And I think you know we can do a lot when we're looking at development to control for businesses of what they're supposed to do in terms of their lighting fixtures, yet we inflict these field lights on people with no standards at all. And could you speak to that issue, please? Thank you. Yeah, that, that is a, a real uh, challenge in the past because high, 
Well, metal halide lighting, which was the standard for sports lighting, unfortunately the standard was also uh, spun, spun parabolic fixtures, fixtures that just basically shotgunned the light. You put a, put a metal halide lamp and you just blasted it out. They evolved over many, many years to get more and more shielding, uh, louvers, almost anything to try to direct the light better. The problem was, in a residential neighborhood, you were never going to get enough distance between a field and the residence to make it to minimize the negative impact. So it has been a, a real hot button issue down in my neck of the woods because Northern Virginia no longer has any land. So when they're putting in a new sports field or they end up lighting a field that was already there, the impact on the community around it is devastating. Uh, and I can only tell you the good news is, once again, LED will solve this problem. Uh, one of the major manufacturers of lighting, uh, sports lighting, uh, adopted a full cutoff LED fixture. Uh, I've only, I only know of one lighting manufacturer at this point that's doing that. What that means is they're doing the same thing we've talked about here, is they're going to put a fixture and they're going to individually direct the light down across the field. So across the field, you don't even see that light. And that's pretty breathtaking. The control is the same as we see on the streets. You can make sure it doesn't go past the, the sidelines. And just a year or two ago, it was almost out of range and price because LED of that massive, that's a lot of light to light a sports field. And that would cost a lot for the fixtures. So it might have cost you three to four times the normal cost of an HID system. Today, it might be at most 25 or 30 percent more than what you were paying for HID lighting in the past. So for all communities going forward, I highly recommend specifying full cutoff LED for all sports lighting. The impact off-site 50 yards from that field, uh, you won't notice that they're on. Uh, and the other value is they can be dimmed. So 70, 80 percent of the play on most fields is not competition play. It doesn't have to be at full brightness. You can play practice scrimmage at 25 percent of the lighting levels. That's the standard. It's in the standard. So you're still meeting standards, reducing the lighting by 75 percent most of the time. That's community-friendly lighting. Are you talking about gospel lighting by any chance? Yes, I am. Yep. Only group, I promote anybody that does it. That's the only group that I know of that currently sells any full cutoff lighting. Thank you. Okay. So, oh, we have to wait for the microphone. Okay. When you have a dimmer, uh, does that really save energy or you just increase the resistance and so you have the same power going through? As soon as you dim lights, you reduce the energy use at the same amount. So if you dim them 50%, you reduce your energy bill 50%. Same with your home, same with you know LED lighting, uh, anything. Okay. Somebody's back there. So I'm curious about um, whether there's any impact of sort of prevailing weather conditions on lighting choices. You know, I know in Seattle there was a lot of consideration around sort of foggy, drizzly conditions and how that played into lighting selection. I wonder if you could comment on that more generally. Yeah, uh, traditionally, for fog and for snow and for any sort of inclement weather, uh, we used to use something uh, called fog lights on your car. They were amber. Uh, the reason they were amber is amber light penetrates fog better than white light. So there's been a lot of discussion and research about this for highways. Uh, if we're switching to high CCT white light, what is the impact going to be on drivers when the fog rolls in, when the snow rolls in? And the conclusion of most of the research and actually the Highway Safety Administration is you got to put dimmers on. You got to put adaptive controls. Then, in those kind of situations, you can reduce the light level by 50%, 75%, whatever it takes to improve visibility. Once again, we circle back over and over again. Visibility is important, not the brightness level. If you don't reduce the level with fog, 
the more light you put out. Try this in the next time you're driving in fog. Turn your high beams on. It, it really works well, doesn't it? That's what happens with high intensity uh, light coming from you know, traditional roadway fixtures. So the answer is use warmer color temperature. In some places, they have tested something called bimodal, which is a great compromise, but it's more expensive. Uh, you actually have something called phosphor converted amber LEDs in the same fixture as traditional white LEDs. And it can be controlled remotely through an adaptive control system. When you have those conditions, it turns off the white and turns on the amber. So the real cool part is you can actually run both of them all the time to get more light output, and it gives you a warmer white light. Uh, so there's lots of options, and you know, you might know, you might be able to tell, I'm kind of an enthusiast of uh, the opportunities of LED, and we keep finding new ways to do it, and there's lots of things we need to fix. Uh, the good news is we're learning quickly, uh, but we just have to get the message out so people can make informed decisions. The problem is those fixtures will be up for 25 years. Mark my words, the most you're going to have to do to most of those fixtures that are being sold today is change a driver in 10 years. Uh, that part of the system, unfortunately, is old school, and it's not going to last forever. Uh, but that will be a minor price to pay. We used to have to change lamps in every fixture every four to five years. Okay, now once every 10 years, we might have to get up on that uh, truck and change a driver. It's good news. Yeah, it's good news. Um, right there. Oh. Thank you, Eric. To break oh, okay. Oh, well Sorry. Oh, okay. <laughs> right. um, talking about controls for a second. Um, when uh, the town goes and buys uh, fixtures, are we going to be locked into one vendor's control system forever? Uh, so if we decide to do other smart cities kinds of things, we're locked into that vendor? No. Uh, the really good news is I've reviewed the RFP that's out there, and you're asking for a NEMA 7 uh, socket. That means that a future date you can interview and choose the best wireless system that's available at that time. Uh, in smaller communities, sometimes we've actually seen them using uh, individual manual controls that are kind of a, 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 a stopgap measure. If you don't have enough lights to justify putting in a massive uh, wireless system which has some uh, back-end costs, uh, you can at least program it to do exactly what you want. The downside is, is once you screw it in on the pole, it's going to do that forever, but it's never going to do anything else until you get back up and program it. So no, uh, you have the ability to make those uh, changes down the road and, and choose the best system when you do it. So we have time for a couple more questions, and then we're going to head outside to our outdoor lighting demonstration that was put up earlier today. A great peril with the ladder, but um, so st stick around. We just we're going to take a question here. A uh, comment and a question. Uh, if you look on the back of one of these uh, handouts, there's some pictures of shielded and unshielded. If you look at the top, of the left one. And if you've been in Needham Center lately, where they've redone the whole center over there, the right-hand one is there, and it is blinding when you go around the corner. And my question is uh, on um, the right or the left? On the left, where it says unshielded, and there are three pictures there. Yeah. The right-hand one is what's in Needham Square now. <laughs> I, I, I know they are, and I have personal experience with the ones that need them. They are very bad. Okay, the question is, uh, what is the light spread that you're proposing uh, with the uh, new fixtures? I assume they're the same height of, off the ground, uh, but the current ones, they're on every other pole, more or less, which is about 300 feet. And you tend to get a dark spot. It doesn't, the spread doesn't quite go from pole to pole. Right. 
what w will the spread be on the new one versus the old one? Well, if you go out and look at the pilot test that your uh, MLP has put in, you'll see that the dark spot between those poles is almost eliminated. Okay, that's being done using a distribution called a Type Two, which is looks like a cigar. It, it really elongates. You, it was very difficult to get that kind of coverage with an old HID, so you always saw dark spots. A typical HID, high pressure sodium, would have to have a pole every 70 feet uh, to do any good at all. And those fixtures were not put up on their own poles, they're on utility poles, and the utility poles only need to be that distance to string wires, and that's why the compromise. Uh, I will mention this, and, and this isn't saying, this isn't being derogatory, is that there's a compromise in eliminating that shadow, okay? That dark spot between two fixtures, the only way that that can be illuminated is to push light out at a very high angle. So a type two fixture is going to have to put light out a lot of light up to 70 degrees. And when you go up to 70 degrees, you're getting into that window of glare. So it's a compromise. And, and as a community, that's what you want to decide whether you are okay with that. And so I would recommend when you look at the lights, look at the glare, okay? There will be no glare underneath the fixtures. The LED distributes the light so well that We've measured, you have great uniformity. Underneath the fixture, it's the same as it is 30 feet away. So you have this blanket of even uniformity. The downside is, to get that uniformity, you have to push light out. Increasing uniformity has been the goal of all street lighting folks for the last 50 years. It's part of the standard, okay? You have to meet a certain uniformity you can now go crazy with uniformity. And I, I can tell you from LA, LA preached nothing about, they only had two, one, two to one, three to one uniformity. They were the best in the country. And they did it the same way. They pushed a lot of light out into your eyes. So walking down those streets is not pleasant in LA. And I've done it. So that is a visual comfort compromise. And uh, I don't, I'm not, blaming anybody, I'm not you know, saying what is right, what is wrong, but that is a community standard as well. You want to decide what you are comfortable with walking. So when you walk these pilot tests, is this how you, would you want to go out and walk your dog, okay? And if you say yes, tell everybody that that's the way you, you would like it. Uh, and you're not going to have any dark holes in between your light fixtures, pretty much. Uh, it's doing a phenomenal job of uniformity now. Thank you. Okay. Oh, do we have all right, one more quick question? Sure. Okay, sorry. And then we will head right outside, right out back. It's on a ladder. But with the um, way that the control systems will work, might individual neighborhoods be able to differ from other neighborhoods uh, as to the... Um, the level of control, because obviously we have very different neighborhoods. We have more densely populated ones, we have more downtown type ones, and we have others where houses are really very spaced very far apart. I didn't understand the question, sorry. Oh. Is that directed I was, I was to maybe, maybe it's directed oh. to Paul. <laughs> okay, so I'm sorry. Um, let me, if I understand your question, it, it is would the controls be able to be varied and customized to any particular neighborhood yes. and the needs and, and desires. Um, you know, my understanding, and, and again, Bob, correct me if I'm wrong, I mean, anything that is uh, you know, established uh, by electronic controls throughout the community has the ability to be sliced and diced uh, however we might want to, uh, to to do it. So that is part of the, the discussion we're gonna have moving forward is what are exactly the, the, the correct levels of lighting for uh, every particular uh, neighborhood. And you know, we'll, we'll have to figure out how granular we really need and, and, and can be with, with regard to that, uh, not 
technically can be, but but how much we want to, to, to do that as a community. So yeah, absolutely, that's that's part of the discussion I think we need to have going forward. I, I will put my thumb on the scale, but uh, do look at your pilot test because they are doing exactly what we've been recommending to cities across the country, is that using the minimum illumination levels as specified in the RPA today is the best way to approach this. Doing less light than that at this time, the only reason that you could do that is if you do a study and you find that the load of traffic and pedestrians is at a certain level for that local road or any road classification, and you might find that after you've got controls, the next question you're going to be asked is, at what time do you want to dim? Do you want to come down at 9 o'clock, 10 o'clock, midnight? Uh, but you will be able to, and that's a community standard that you can weigh in and give your feedback on. So, Bob, just to, to follow up on that, I, I live on a road that happens to be a, a major thoroughfare for people walking back from the train station. And, you know, we know that the train comes in at 9 o'clock at night because I see Kathleen walking by, coming home from work at that time. Um, we would be able to illuminate that area at, from 9 until 9.30 and then turn it back down. Exactly. Uh, you might choose 10 o'clock, you might choose, you know, 11, midnight. You want to make sure there's enough light on the road at all times. The standard's pretty specific about the quantity of traffic, so you have to do some traffic counts. You have to, you don't have to test every road, but you have to get a, a typical for different types of areas. And the cool part about controls is you don't have to be right out of the gate. If you find out that there's, hey, there's a lot of activity over here we didn't know about, it's one button on the computer, let's up that. Let's not go down as early. Infinite control is, is the really great part about adaptive controls. Okay. So thank you very much. Um, can we have a round of applause for our speakers tonight? Oh. oh. Uh, this is a nice gizmo available on uh, Amazon. It's a desk lamp. But I was shocked by the fact that it's trying to give you a selection of color temperatures. So I've got to go through all these to know where we started, but I think we're at 5,000 K. Okay, so that's 5,000 K. This was the standard for street lights only two or three years ago. Uh, that was what everybody was putting in. The reason they were putting that in, it was the most efficacy. In fact, you couldn't get the same efficacy as a high pressure sodium five years ago without using at least 5,000 K. That's how we got to this point of color temperature. But they give you the option now to choose, okay, do you like about 4,000 K? That's 4,000 K. A lot of your main drag lights that were installed five years ago are 4,000, well, I'm sorry, the decoratives are 5,000K, but you have a lot of 4,000K. This was the standard up until two or three years ago. How about 3,000? Is that feeling better? How about 2,200? That's not even commonly available, but that's what you would get with a very warm white light. Nobody needs to be afraid of CCT. We're evolving, fixtures are evolving. You will find visual comfort improving in every manufacturer. It just takes encouragement. <laughs> they're, they're selling as fast as they can. You give them the feedback that you want something different and they'll build it for you. Okay, so this concludes this part of the talk and we're going to go outside. So it's right in back of us, but I think we have to go out and around. Those waveguides that we're seeing are directing all the light left and right evenly without glare. Okay, so that's the best way to approach lighting visual comfort. Bob, would this be the height that you would be talking about? No, would this would be probably over two times as high. Uh, I don't know exactly what your fixtures are at, but I'm guessing 25 feet. Yeah, 22 to 28, just on the height. Right. 
This is only uh, about 12 feet. <laughs> so uh, think of that at twice as high or more and that lighting level will be about right for your residential community. So it is going to be, because of the way light works, four times brighter than what it should be. Uh, but still, look at the quality of the light, look at the evenness of the light, and once again, you all probably want to just slide sideways because you, you, if you are evenly divided, when you see the other light, uh, you'll see what I'm talking about. But so that's a, a fixture that's only been available for f about six months. Can you tell who makes that fixture box? That's Cree. That's a Cree RSW. And that's, like I said, a new technology for visual comfort. CREE? -E? CREE -E SW? That one won't dim. I'll, I'll show you dimming on this side. Uh -huh. uh, but so that's what you can get. And once again, I reinforce that the efficacy of that fixture at 2700K, which realistically, that's what we ordered, it's actually 2500K because no matter what you order, there will be a variation in each batch. That one is 200 uh, CCT warmer. So you're actually seeing, I think, and I'm prejudiced, but the best color temperature for a uh, residential community. It is so comfortable on the eye. We can now move over and look. This Evluma is a, uh, it's a, it's an amazing fixture in that it's doing visual comfort a completely different way, but it still has good efficacy. It's using a frosted glass to, to diffuse those bright light sources. So you can still look up at that and not really have any problem. Now that's at its lowest level. Let me bring it up at typically, I should have brought my light meter out. I'll do this by eye. That light level, a little more, come on guy. I love tablets. <laughs> okay, that is probably, if you engineer it for a city street, that's going to be the lighting level that you will have under it. That is 3000K. Uh, I'm sorry, that is 2700K. But it is a, a, a solid 2700K, it's not 2500. So if you look at the two, you might be able to tell that difference, but that's not much difference. Uh, but both of them give you what we promote as visual comfort. I can walk down as a pedestrian in any street with these lights, and I am never going to see glare. And that means I can be walking down from a distance of 30 feet, and I can walk under it. I can look up and look down, and I don't have any flashbulb burn. So that's, that's the optimum. That's what we want to say. Communities, you have options that you didn't have just a year ago. Neither of these fixtures were available just one year ago. And the color temperature wasn't on the, on the sheet. You can now get these both ordered at this color temperature. You don't have to special order them. Uh, yeah. It's also four times as bright as it's supposed to be. That's the problem, is I can't dim that one, and that one should be on a pole 25 to 25 feet high. It's only at 12 feet, or at most. So if think about what it would look like at one quarter of the, the output. And that's what we have over here. We were able to dim this one, and this is what that lighting level should be on a, on a safe street. So don't, you know, don't slam the Cree because I didn't have a dimmer for it. Uh, but uh, put at 25 feet, that's an exceptionally good fixture this from vision. Luma, this is Ev Luma, E-V, E-V, L-U, Ev Luma, E-V, L-U-M-A. They're a company out of uh, Washington State. Uh, they've been uh, a popular fixture with utility companies out there. Uh, they also make a great retrofit for globe lights, uh, those awful acorn lights that we saw, LEDs that retrofit and, and do a better job of softening the glare, but they never make them good. So this is a great fixture. And it's very similar to the visual quality of the one I showed you on the screen, that other one I'm using in a condo project. Uh, but the lights are not being directed up. 
but they are using a uh, soft white diffuser and they're using a reflector. So they're capturing all the light as that they can. So any questions? Come to my town. <laughs> What's that? Okay. <laughs> Do you typically use less light um, when you're doing a replacement project than what currently exists? Actual typically, every project that we consult on uh, is overlit. And it's overlit in a, a, a historic way because of the high pressure sodium that they, people felt like they needed more light than the IS minimum. Okay, so the IS minimum. Since you guys are getting blinded by all that light, uh, what are the chances I could pull the right one out? No, I'm not going to because then I'll have to reprogram the uh, Evluma. Uh, but when we do the first assessment we do, if you're switching to LED is what would the proper light level be? And that's in the standards. You use the IS recommended practices. And once you find it, you use the absolute minimum that the IS allows. Uh, in this case, uh, once again, this is the same light level as the HPS that was being replaced in your pilot test. Okay, So you have to think about, does this seem brighter than what you had? And most people will say this is 50% brighter if you put them side by side. And that's just because white light is so easier to see under. The visibility is so good. I can take this down to its absolute minimum. That's uh, that's probably less than the IAS min. Of course, we're being you know we got some uh, over <laughs> we got light coming from the Cree. Uh, but you can see as you go out, that may be less than IAS min, but it's still a comfortable lighting level to walk down the street. And that's what I would predict in the future we'll be able to use. The lighting levels, once the standards are updated, are going to give communities the ability to use a lower lighting level. That's going to mean you're going to save more energy. And all you have to do is have controls. Because once you choose a fixture, uh, you can't change the quality of the light coming out of it. You can't change the color of the light coming out of it. But you can always change the brightness, the intensity. So that's good news. As long as you do what the MLP has done is make sure you get a NEMA socket so that you can easily s step up on top, take the photo cell out, and put in a wireless control, and then you've updated your system to controls. And it's that easy. Some of the systems now for wireless controls do what we call self-commissioning. Uh, they know where they are when they plug in. They're programmed back at the shop to know exactly what fixture they're going to be in. You, yeah, uh, they, the newest controls, uh, for the last 10 years, the question about controls has been, is it too much complexity? Are they going to be reliable? And uh, unfortunately, 10 years ago, that was a, kind of a crapshoot. Some manufacturers were doing really well. Some manufacturers, not so well. And really, the hard part is it's an added level of complexity. And it's nothing to do with lighting. It's IT. I mean, this is the marriage of computers and lighting. So when you put wireless controls on, you're putting a wireless node, plugging it into the top of a fixture, and it's going to communicate with a gateway hundreds of yards away. That is then going to go into some sort of backbone. That might be the cloud. That might be a hard wire. But then it's going to go to some desk in somebody's office, and they're going to have computer management software, and they can change every aspect of that fixture. They can also tell if it's performing. Has it burned out? means that you can have a maintenance crew proactively going out and seeing that the, the characteristics of a fixture are deteriorating. It's going to fail. And you can probably tell that it's going to fail in six months. But you don't have to wait for it to fail now. The maintenance crew, when they do other maintenance, they just schedule it. They go out to that fixture and change it out. You swap it, you get a new one, you take the old one back and you fix it. This can save, in the case of LA, they now estimate they're saving over $2 million a year just on maintenance. 
Okay, so you add that into the equation, that's what makes LED more affordable. You're reducing maintenance, you're reducing energy cost. And if you do all those things, you check all the boxes, like Cambridge, you're now getting 73% reduction in energy. And even in a small town, that's a whopping amount of money. So. Well, that's, this is one way to address visual comfort, and it is a frosted uh, plastic lens over it. Okay, they're also using a reflector, which means that the light is being diffused, not just coming straight out, it's being bounced around on that reflector, so it's giving you a soft, soft white bounce reflector. Uh, so this is one way to do it. That technology is actually uh, patented. That's a, a new technology that Cree is using, and they were the first ones to uh, the business with it. And they're going to do well because it does such a great job. But we've seen other technology that's equally amazing. Uh, in some of the pedestrian lights we're, we're using for a condo project, there are no visible LEDs at all, period because all the lights, LEDs themselves, are recessed around the perimeter of the fixture, and they are going through a flat waveguide. It's just a disk of polycarbonate, and then they're using that total internal reflection, like the Cree, and they can control the light and it comes out. So you see a disk of light, and it is uniform, and it is beautiful, and there is absolutely no glare. Uh, and for pedestrian scale, I'm mounting them on 10-foot poles so that pedestrians will be able to, you know, enjoy comfort. Uh, and it's, it's only, that's only been shipping for about a year or two. So, so much has changed just in the last year. It's, you know, revolutionizing an industry that's already been revolutionized. So it's making everybody over at the MLP crazy because every time they think they've figured out what's available <laughs> next week there's something else uh, and everybody just loves to have to keep up like a computer magazine on what's going to be available next week uh, but that's what we try to do we get a lot of the early uh, demonstration units of it I had the RSW six months ago we've been showing everybody and unfortunately for the last six months I've been saying wait wait you'll be able to get it almost at any time uh, they're now shipping so that's the great part uh, but you know how long will Wellesby's demonstration project be up? Does anybody know? The surveys are due back by October 13th. Mm -hmm. The okay. lights will remain in place until we do the conversion in that neighborhood once okay. the final decision is made on those. Okay. Surveys are due back by the 13th of October. You can do them online. You can mail them. We're mailing. We're doing a, a, a mailing to every resident in town. We're encouraging folks to fill those out. We would like to get feedback. Now, uh, let me cl be clear. You you have an RFP, and you're looking for other vendors to meet the standards that you're putting out. You haven't actually picked a fixture yet. We did not select right. a fixture. Right, so right. you're looking for other vendors to tell you what their best options are. And, and we put it out as a request for proposal right. so that we don't have to buy least cost. Right. We can value different options um, and prioritize the lights, get the fixtures that we want. I'm going to pu put a plug in for that fixture. Uh, I, I, can, I can tell you that that fixture, uh, the Cree, because it's only available in the last few uh, months, but that future proofs you in the, in the fact that that technology, that visual comfort is so much better than what was available in the past and the cost is almost negligible. So, you know, if you're going to do controls, and you do something with high visual comfort, quite honestly, you will be state-of-the-art and you will be a model community, which I promoted the hell out of Cambridge for the last you know, couple years, and I would love to co promote the hell out of Wellesley as using the best. You're already doing half of, you know, 75% of it. You got the color temperature, you got the lighting level, uh, the visual comfort's the only thing left, and, and I, I think that would be awesome to look at uh, options like that. Uh, but I don't get any money from Cree, just so you know. Some of it also tells the contrasting features of that light over there. That's uh, metal halide. That's an old, older technology that's uh, what was used in a lot of parking lots. 
Uh, it never got used in street lights all that much, uh, but its cousin is the uh, high pressure sodium, which is what you use throughout the city. So and how that, much more energy is that one using than, say, this one here? That light is probably, yeah, I'm going to say, uh, 80 to 100 watt high pressure sodium. And this one over here is 32 watts. And this one over here with the dimming we have is probably close to 10 watts. So, you know, that one will go up to 40 watts, but we're using it with only 10 watts. So you compare, that's a 90% energy reduction for almost the same lighting level that you see. That one, the lighting level is higher. So if we brought it up to 20 or 30, what's that? Well, it's, it's metal halide, and metal halide had a lot of blue. Its uh, color temperature is around 4,000 K. Uh, so it is similar to the first or the last generation of LED, the same sort of color. So, and th the only place this has been used primarily is in retail. It's been used in car lots. It's been used in uh, Home Depot used it in their parking lots for God knows what reason. because it's four times brighter than it should be at that mounting height. We should be able to dim it down to the same lighting level as this fixture. And if we did that, you can see how much more light is over there as opposed to over here. And that is four times at least the lighting level you need in a residential community. So that's why it feels glary. But that is dimmable, correct? That is dimmable. Yeah, I just don't have a dimmer on it. Uh, the nice thing about this Ebluma and the thing that, you know, blew me away is for the price of the fixture, no options whatsoever, you can control it. So for small communities, we're promoting this when you don't want to put in wireless controls. Wireless controls is an expensive proposition, much more money. This fixture is only about 200 bucks, and it includes what would be probably $100 worth of controls. Uh, for a small community, that's an option. That And, and some of, you know, like my residential, you know, condo communities are looking at this. Um, and you can use that on a roadway, you can use that in a parking lot, you can use it anywhere you want. Once again, I get no money from Evluma, I get no money from Cree. This is the, on, this is the Envoy controller. Correct? This is this, and LED, I'll show you. Photo control. And it has this great little app, which is Unfortunately, I have the beta version of it. We're talking about Cree still, though, right, Bob? What's that? You're talking about I'm talking about the Evoluma no, on Evoluma. this side. Okay, okay. Sorry. You'll yeah. be interested. That It Which also has a GPS well. built yep. in. It it's tells you where it is. It tells you the level at it. And it has a... This, uh, this is yeah, the tablet's problem, <laughs> not the light. Mm -hmm. But so I can schedule this to do the dimming we talked about. So say at rush hour, it's gonna come on at that level, uh, at a full pole height. And then at nine o'clock, I'm going to program it to reduce its light level to that. Mm -hmm. And I don't have to pay anything else. All the controls are in there. It's okay, completely self-contained. And but uh, that's integral, and then you're locked into their controls for their light. This is this integrated, is this is part okay. of the system, and okay. it's, uh, it's a, it's a Bluetooth uh, mm -hmm. control. Is, is, is there a NEMA 7 socket on it? No, no. not on this, but on that okay. uh, it does. On the Cree, you've got that NEMA 7, so you can pop in any control, uh, and you can upgrade it in the future for wireless. I've, I, I've specified a lot of them with a manual control. There is a, a same thing that you put your Wi-Fi or your wireless uh, node you can put in a programmable timer that does exactly what we're doing here, and that costs about seventy-five dollars for a node, and that's a very low cost of controls. Yes. Another question about when you have a lot of traffic at night, the headlights of the cars are also complicating the picture because they're shedding a lot of light. Well, absolutely, and that's why those updated standards actually acknowledge the fact that light headlights are so much better than they were just a decade ago. They're 400% brighter. They have more control. They're, they're focused like a, a light fixture focuses light. And uh, they do a better job of uh, identifying an obstacle, a dog, a person on the road than any overhead lighting actually can do in 30 miles per hour or less. 
beyond 30 miles per hour, you're actually going to outrun your headlights. You can't stop based on what you see. Uh, so that's why there's no recommendation to turn off the lights in neighborhoods above 30 miles per hour. I'm Does sorry? It, your recommendation for Wellesley or the te Wellesley test would be Cree? Well, um, the, the Cree is a roadway fixture and it, it's available in all the distribution patterns that a, a city needs. So you get your type 2 like you're demoing now. Mm -hmm. uh, the Wellesley is available in a type 3, type 4. It's not available in a type 2. It's not really designed as that kind of utility roadway fixture. So uh, for that reason, it's slight compromise. Uh, but the, the price difference is also, you know, that's a $200 fixture in quantity. The Cree is probably less than 170 So it's, uh, it's, it's cheaper. Uh, 